Welcome to our annual Suji Kim Assembly. I would like to invite our president, Sister Carolyn McCormick, to come forward and introduce this special assembly for everyone. Thank you, Casey. And good morning to you, Tolox. Good morning, faculty, staff, and especially good morning to our honored guests. It is my pleasure to open this year's Su Jin Kim Assembly and to set it in a context of our Fletcher Sacred Heart Academy community. Su Jin Kim entered Flintridge as a freshman in September 1997. She was a member of the class of 2001, a wonderful student, and a skilled equestrian. Tragically, Su Jean and a companion were killed in an automobile accident in July between her freshman and sophomore years while traveling to compete in an equestrian match in Pebble Beach. This was an incredible loss for her parents, her sister Su Kei, her friends, our Flintridge School community, and the equestrian community she belonged to. At a celebration of Su Jean's life, her trainer said of her, Su Jean was committed to her horse and her sport. She was soft-spoken, well-mannered, an A student, the kind of teenager who made her parents proud. She was the kind of girl any horse show community aspires to produce. Following Su Jean's death, her parents, Peter and Sunny Kim, established the Su Jean Kim Educational Endowment in her memory. Each year, this endowment supports activities at the school that promote the spiritual and academic enrichment of the lives of you, our future students, faculty, and staff. The Su Jean Kim Math Award is given each year to an outstanding senior math student as chosen by the faculty of the math department. The Su Jean Kim Lecture Series event, which we are celebrating today, offers a Catholic faith-centered inspirational experience for our community in her honor. It is the Kim's desire to keep Su Jean's memory alive at Fletcher's Sacred Heart and to enrich and strengthen our Dominican mission with experiences and presentations that inspire us in every way. We are particularly blessed this year to welcome Beverly B. Smeyer as our speaker for this very special assembly. Bev is an amazing Flintridge Sacred Heart graduate and Toma. Her story will inspire all of us deeply. May I ask our student body officers to please come forward and introduce this outstanding graduate to our Flintridge Sacred Heart community. Working in the defense plant 
of Lockheed Aircrafts Company in Burbank, California, where she worked as a dispatcher and an expediter. Miss Spitfire and five of her friends heard about women being recruited and are set for military flying, so they decided to give a try. Because it was wartime, security demanded that all flight training had to be 100 miles inland from the coast. So the young women traveled each week to Bishop, California, a six-hour drive from Los Angeles, each Friday evening at the end of work, and friends would drive to Bishop and get instructions for flying on Saturday and Sunday morning. Then they returned each Sunday night so they would be ready for work on Monday. Ms. Biesmeyer wanted to get moving in the process of learning how to fly, so she took a leave of, of absence from her job to go to Quartzville, Arizona. There she spent three weeks getting her private pilot's license, which was a requirement to apply to the Women's Air Force Service Pilots Program. After a security screening and, a per and personal references were checked, then a personal interview and a physical, Ms. Biesmeyer was finally sent a telegram to report to Sweetwater, Texas, for a class 44-5 on December 7th, 1943. It was a cold place in the winter and she was flying the Stearman PT-13 with an open cockpit exposed to the elements. It was hot in the summer and she flew in the closed canopies of the BT-13 and the AT-6. She was then stationed at the Merced Army Base and eventually transferred to the B-26 pilot training program at Las Vegas Army Base. Ms. Biesmeyer even flew the B-26 Martin Marauder for target practice while live ammunition was being fired on her ship. <laughs> the Women Air Force Service pilots were abruptly deactivated in December of 1944. Without warning, the program was shut down. Those in the loss were let go with no pay, nothing but their experience and enthusiasm. enthusiasm. After deactivation, Ms. Biesmeyer worked at the Monrovia Airport in California, flying and then ferrying planes from the factory to their destination, all as a part of the war effort. This continued until the end of World War II. The demand for female pilots stopped after peacetime began, and it was time to change careers, so she went to work for an employment agency. After two years, she opened up the Beverly Cross Agency with a partner, having an office in Westwood near the University of California Los Angeles campus and then another in Beverly Hills, California. Ms. Biesmeyer's employment agency placed office personnel with advertising agencies, theatrical agencies, movie stars, and well-established business firms. She owned the agency for more than 20 years. While owning the agency, Ms. Biesmeyer bought and sold property in Venice and Marina del Rey, California. She spent time fixing up, paneling, painting for resale, or as we say now, flipping houses. <laughs> she wanted another hobby, something fun. Since Ms. Biesmeyer lived by the beach in Marina del Rey Harbor, a boat seemed like a great idea, right, obviously? Um, <laughs> she bought a single-engine 28-foot cruiser. A twin-engine cruiser was the next purchase. A 34-foot boat with 250 horsepower engines. This was a speedy one named the Seabit 2. She was occasionally challenged to a race now and then, so after toying with the competition, we would hit the throttle and wave goodbye. She became known as the Hot Rod Girl of Marina Del Rey. <laughs> with retirement in mind, Miss Beesmeyer moved to Oklahoma. There she purchased and developed property went back to her art and participated in craft and art shows. Missing California, she moved back. Living in Leisure World in Laguna Hills, California, Miss Biesmeyer enjoyed improving her golf game. <laughs> <laughs> However, it wasn't until 2010 that they received full recognition in military status. Ms. Biesmeyer and the WASS received the Congressional Gold Medal in 2010. She stood on the steps of the Capitol building in full uniform with 169 of her sister service women. The Women Air Force Service Pilot Program was only two years long, but it paved the way for the women in Air Force Service today. 
This program proved that women could not only fly planes, but they could fly large planes under stressful and dangerous conditions. In later years, Ms. Biedemeyer had a small interview on television talking about her experience with the WASP program called Reamand Flight and another television interview with the dedication of the WASP statue at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She also interviewed for the Los Angeles Times on the WASP in 1996. Ms. Biesmeyer received a Distinguished Service Award from the Sacred Heart Academy on March 25, 1995. She also was an interviewee on the film we saw last month, We Serve Two. Let's please give her a round of applause and welcome her comments and take some of, or ask her some questions about her experience. Unfortunately, when um, 
the center of 44, and the war eased down. Uh, the boys started coming home from overseas, uh, pilots that is. Uh, they decided they wanted the jobs that we were doing. So they and they in Congress and a few others said to us politely, you can go home now. And that's what they did. They actually said goodbye. And we had to figure out how to get home and go forget it. They forgot us for, for many years until 1977, when, when the Air Force at that time recognized a woman that, that the first woman to ever fly a military aircraft. Well, we got our dander up. And we went to Congress and we said, uh -uh, we were the first ones. So we got the uh, recognition with the congressional men. Got to Washington, D.C. I went to Washington, D.C. Is a, is, a, is given to only civilian who did outstanding work for the war, like Bob Cole and the Indians. They had their code, the Indian code, they used it for the war, and, and things like that. So it's kind of a, uh, it's not a military uh, medal, but it is recognized, and it's kind of rare. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? No, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to know? Uh, in towing targets, when I flew, I flew with B-17 beside me in formation, and the boys that were practicing gunnery school out of the belt of the plane would fly beside us, and then they would shoot the, out of the turret, out of the side of the plane, and out of the back turret, and they would shoot live 50 caliber at a sock that we would tow behind our plane. And of course, sometimes uh, they would get a little eager and, and, and advance the sock a little bit. And I, the only time I came down with in problem was a hole in the tail once, and that was a little close. <laughs> Hi, I'm, sorry. I'm Kelly, and my question is, what was Hello? Okay. What was the Air Force Base? You know, it's it's hard for me, not only I can't see, but I can't hear you. <laughs> what was the Air Force Base in Sweetwater, Texas like? Could you please describe what it did would be like? Air Force Base, Sweetwater. <laughs> Sweetwater, it was windy, it was dusty, it was dirty, and it was cold in the wintertime and hotter than the Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, in the, in the wintertime, we were flying at, uh, uh, oh, by the way, the, the, when we reported to the base, they just had a cattle truck and they drove us up to the base. It was three miles out of town. And they let us out. They, they, we had only a suitcase. It's all equipment we could take. And they would, uh, brought the, uh, let us out. We marched to the room, to quarters. We were living in barracks that were uh, set up originally. The field, the venture field, uh, was set up originally for the European boys coming over to learn to fly the American planes. So it was close. So they left and we came in. But it was cold. There was no heat in the air in the quarters. There was no condition in the quarters. And as I say, it was dusty and dirty. And in the winter time I was flying a, a biplane, which is an open cockpit, and they had the worst winter they ever had. And the icicles were three feet, I say feet, high off the hangers. I had, I had a, a I, I was from California and I didn't know what cold was. <laughs> anyway, so I wrote my mother and I said, 
please send me some long drafts of your work. <laughs> and she did. She sent me that sweater and whatever else we had by the time we wore everything we had, plus the time when we went to bed at the end of nine o'clock, we had to check out. I mean, they came and checked the skin at bedtime at nine o'clock. And then I was still wearing the same thing I had flying because it was so cold and it would change. You never took anything off. Never. <laughs> I'm Allie, and my question is, um, what was Flint Ridge like when you went here? What was what? Small. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was it was really fun because uh, uh, I lived in the, in the cottages, and of course she uses it in the office now. And, and, and it was it was very pleasant, and it was. Uh, Typical school, you know. We had to do everything according to what the sisters and, the, and we kept telling us to do. <laughs> <laughs> it was delightful. I enjoyed every minute of it. And it was, we we're high enough so that if there was a football game, I could see it at the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Greg, and what kind of business advice would you give these Tolaks? I mean, you must have had a, a great experience in succeeding as a businesswoman. And what would you say in these trying days is the secret to be a successful businesswoman? Well, when I got out of the water, I couldn't find a job flying. They didn't want them pilots. So I did finally get a job in my own airport, and I was I got an instructor training, and I also I managed the airport with just about everything from planes to, to stacking planes. So, anyway, uh, when I uh, got this over with, and there was no future, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they sold the, air, the airport. So, I went to an employment agency and I got a little, and I asked for a job, and they gave me the job there to be one of the house interview you all do two jobs. 
Well, anyway, after a while, uh, I decided I'd open my own employment agency. <laughs> and uh, the name of it was Beverly Cross Agency. And uh, there was two people, one Beverly and one Pat Cross. I had to get the first, talk, uh, first choice because you couldn't say the Cross Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I, I ended up in that job, and we became very well known. And, um, and then I, we got secretaries like the party table. Of course, you people don't know the party table. <laughs> but anyway, it was a success, and I retired from that. And I think I retired early, too. <laughs> This isn't a question, but it is a comment on the book that I'd like to share with the student body. I'm Sister Catherine Chain. Uh, with Beverly, I am a graduate, not a 37. Um, when you, but you really need to check out the book. Bev's name is not there as being the author. However, a good portion of the book is based on the diary that she kept while she was a boss. And secondly, the pictures the drawings that are in the book are drawings that she did. Yeah, that was, that was the, the stories when I was in when, when I was in training, and I'd write to my folks and I'd tell them what we did every day. And, and a lot of the time, the language was very strange. Well, we did an emblem. I said, "What's an emblem?" Well, anyway. <laughs> That's the story that we really Hi, Beverly. My name's Maureen. I was wondering if you would tell us of a specific mission, perhaps the most dangerous or memorable or important. Well, I think when we were put on, when, when, when one time we went on a flight and killing targets at one time, besides like the hole in the tail, uh, there's what they did was there was a crew man in there, and at the back of the plane was empty where the bombers went out sometimes. And they had a tow, and we dropped the cable. The cable was about this big around. And, it, and so it, we let it go 150 feet was how far we went. If it was a bigger cable, we sometimes cheated and let it go a little further because they were firing at us. And, when they were firing at us, it's like shooting at a bird, you know? You have to figure out the speed of the bird and the wind direction and all that stuff. So, but anyway, one time we were in the, uh, and the crew man came running up and said, we're on fire. I can reach the foot back and the, and the pilot line. And so we looked back and the cable had break had uh, not worked, and the cable kept spinning and spinning and spinning, and it was a brand new cable. So it melted that whole equipment that held the cable and melted it completely down. So we had to dash back, and we landed it in emergency with fire trucks screaming down the runway behind us. That was kind of fun. <laughs> I can't think of any experience, so I did have another plane catch on fire while I was over a lake, and, and uh, it was uh, in Sweetwater, Texas, and it was cold, it was in the winter time. And I looked down, and I said, no, I'm not going to jump. <laughs> That's cold water. <laughs> so I went on and managed to get to the field, and I switched planes. It was just a... The instructor said, oh, it's just an electric fire. Don't worry. But the book of that is full of smoke. Okay. I can't think of anything. We're going to get a couple more questions. Questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm wondering how you financed all of your uniforms and resources that you needed before you became a pilot. We had, when we first 
first time that we had to pay for everything we had on was at the war, except for, as I say, the, the uh, boys that they had been raised prior to that. So we wore, they, when we first got there, the only uniforms they had was a flight suit and a flight jacket, and then that heavy stuff in, in the winter time. And it was all men's clothes. So we had the darndest time because they were large, larger, and big. <laughs> and we were always looking for rubber bands to hold our pants up. <laughs> but then and we had to pay for everything they had. Towards the very end, just about the, uh, well, let's see, probably six, eight months, Jacqueline Crockham, uh, who was the one of the head of the thing, uh, was, uh, was also uh, had a designer in New York design uniforms for us. So we were actually given, well, I think we had a one, I don't remember, but I think we were designed regular blue uniforms. This is not a real true uniform. My uniform right now is in the museum, the Land Air Museum out of John Wayne Air Force. But this is what we have decided we make, um, 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 as we got older and couldn't wear what we had then, we were all getting fatter and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we settled in. And when the women died, you didn't for it? Oh, that was another thing. Like, I guess it's kind of important. When one, if somebody was in an accident or one of the women uh, was killed, <clears throat> Excuse me. When one of the women was killed or anything while we were in training, it was still civil service. We were civilians. So when uh, she would put, we had to pool our money. That all the people in the bay, or the, the, the bay, I call them the bay, we were reporters. And we pooled our money to get enough money to send, and one of the girls would take the body and went into the parents. There was absolutely no help from the military in any way, shape, or form. It was all civilian and all, it was just a job. But, but we flew, I must say, we flew every single type of airplane that the Army Air Force had, including pursuits, and bombers and B-29s and everything. And some of the women even had to carry a 45 when we had to pull up, ferry a plane or take a plane and run that had uh, secret stuff in it. So yeah, we always had to return it. <laughs> one more question. Yeah, one more question. Beverly, did you maintain your private pilot's license? And if so, when did you stop flying? Uh, I would still have it if I could. I'd like to see. But anyway, I would still love to fly, and I still have rubber neck every time a big plane goes by. But I kept my license up until uh, days, kind of. They, they go by too fast. <laughs> uh, I would say it was probably in the 70s. No, no maybe it was in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kept it, kept it as long as I could. And then you to maintain your uh, license, you had to have a physical every two years. So it was a military, not military. Civil At this time, I would like to ask two of our ASB members, please. Ms. Kiesmeyer, we would like to give you the honorarium from the Su Jin Kim Award and some flowers to remind you of what it was like when you graduated here.
that we have another presentation in Ms. Wiesmeyer's honor. So, Mrs. Thomas, would you like to come up and... Sydney Sherman Gilbert is from the class of 1971. She and her husband, Patrick, have an online business where they offer artwork honoring aviation heroes from World War II and other conflicts. They have two artists that create original artwork. When they heard about them, of course they wanted to do a piece to honor her and the wasps of World War II. Their motto is research, remember, honor. So we put them in touch with Beth, and they produced a beautiful piece featuring the plane she flew. That's the B-26, is that right? Yes. Sydney and Patrick have given Bev a piece for her archives and have graciously produced one for Flipper's Sacred Heart Academy. We'd like to thank them for their generosity and for the experience we have all shared as in one of your alumni honors the contributions of another. Sydney, I know you'd like to speak to the piece. Academy. We just are filled with pride this morning, aren't we? Yes. Around our graduates. <laughs> Girls, this can be your life. <laughs> Look at this example for us, for you. Beautiful graduate of the class of 1937 and all the things that she accomplished. And I'm sure Bev would say to you, girls, get going. You can do it too, right? And we want to say thank you to this wonderful alumna who, with her husband, created this beautiful picture in honor of Bev and that we will be able to enjoy. And it will allow us to keep you alive and your memory with us 
in our Flinter Sacred Heart community. So thank you so much. What a special day this is for us on the day. Thank you again to all of our lovely guests for joining us today. 